an eures Mal so Arachnoid Hemorrhage. In the description please find additional information, the disclaimer, and some bibliography. The most common type of spontaneous non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is the rupture of an acquired intracranial aneurysm. When an aneurysm ruptures there are two things that leak. The first is pressure, and the second one is blood. With the leakage of systemic arterial blood pressure, the intracranial pressure is suddenly, briskly, increased to the point that even it may equalize with the systemic blood pressure. When both the arterial blood pressure and the ICP are equalized, then the cerebral perfusion pressure is decreased, leading to loss of brain perfusion and the patient undergoing syncope. If the recovery of the recovery of the CPP is not achieved quickly, by virtue of clotting of the ruptured aneurysm, and recovery of the intracranial pressure enough to re-establish the cerebral perfusion, then cerebral injury ensues. If the period when the cerebral perfusion pressure is low, or zero, is prolonged enough, minutes or longer, then the brain tissue will undergo ischemic injury. The longer the length the longer the length of the loss of consciousness, then the more likely it is that the intracranial pressure was not able to recover quickly, leading to more brain damage. The sudden leakage of the pressure is at least partly responsible for the thunderclap headache. The other element that leaks when the aneurysm ruptures is blood. But, generally the leakage of blood is not the bigger issue early on. In fact when the arterial pressure and the ICP are equalized the actual amount of blood bleeding is in fact decreased. It is later, by virtue of the inflammatory response that this blood is going to induce in the subarachnoid space. What it will lead to the chemical meningitis and arteritis, also known as vasospasm. The most common risk factors for SAH are smoking and chronic arterial systemic hypertension. Other risk factors include excessive alcohol intake, oral contraception, pregnancy, and the use of certain illicit drugs such as cocaine and methamphetamine. The mean age of cerebral aneurysm rupture is 55 years. Women are at higher risk than men. Even though 2 to 4% of the general population has cerebral aneurysms on autopsies, only a very, only a very small number of them actually rupture, about 8 for every 100,000 persons per year. About 20 to 25% of patients will have multiple aneurysms. One of the clinical challenges, at times, becomes trying to identify which one is the aneurysm that ruptured, as that one is the one with the highest risk of rebleeding. About patients with ruptured aneurysms will die before arrival to the hospital. About 25% will die in the first 24 hours. And about 50% will die in the first 30 days. The diagnosis of SAH is suspected in the context of sudden severe thunderclap headache, sudden unexplained unconsciousness, and non-contrast head CT scan with SAH, AH. If the patient does not present to the emergency room early, then the blood could be diluted down by the normal flow of CSF and then not be visible on the head CT scan, in which case the patient would need a lumbar puncture, looking for yellowish CSF. The yellow-colored CSF, xanthochromia, is due to the conversion of hemoglobin into bilirubin. Following this, the patient will have a CT angiogram of the neck and brain, and later the standard cerebral angiogram. The head CT scan demonstrating the presence of SAH in white, evidence of the hyperdensity of the clotted blood. The cerebral angiogram demonstrating a top of the basilar artery aneurysm. The two arteries just below and to the sides of the aneurysm are the posterior aneurysm are the posterior cerebral arteries. Once a diagnosis is made, the airway, breathing, circulation and differential diagnosis are secured, as clinically indicated. The patient will be admitted to the intensive care unit using the SAH order set. The daily megabundle is initiated. The goal SBP is generally set at the range between 100 to mercury and kept there until the aneurysm is secured. The head of the bed is up 30 degrees. Minimizing the sedation to be able to preserve the neurologic examination. Pain is controlled, and physical efforts are also decreased, as possible. The goal is to maintain normal volemia, using normal saline, and avoiding the use of albumin during the entire hospital stay. But will stay. During the vasospasm, the goal is normal volemia, systolic blood pressure between 140 and 200, depending on the degree of vasospasm, normocarbia, normothermia, and the use of nemotipine. Try to maintain the vital signs as stable as possible, and optimize the patient for cerebral angiogram or surgery. The team will decide whether the aneurysm should be coiled or clipped. Either one aims at preventing rebleeding. Having the aneurysm secured early not only decreases the risk of rebleeding but also makes the induction of hypertension easier and safer. Complications from rupture of aneurysms include brain damage or injury due to the leakage of the blood pressure leading to cerebral ischemia, emia, also the actual jet of arterial blood into the parenchyma inducing hematoma in the brain and mass effect. A few days later, the patient may develop vasospasm, which can lead to cerebral ischemia and strokes. The leakage of blood around the brain may slow down the flow of the CSF, 
and the blood clots may clog the normal CSF escape into the venous blood. So, the ICP and the accumulation of CSF, inducing hydrocephalus, that may require the insertion of an EVD. The sudden hemodynamic changes induced by the acute rupture of the aneurysm, and the consequent massive hypersympathetic discharge, can lead to neurogenic myocardium including shock, in addition to neurogenic pulmonary edema. Other complications include deep venous thrombosis, infections, gastric ulcers, pressure ulcers, acute kidney injury, hyponatremia, cognitive impairment, and death, among many others. One of the scales used in the context of SAH is the Fisher grading scale, which goes from 1 to 4. It correlates the amount of blood to the risk of vasospasm. Essentially, the more blood there is in the subarachnoid space the higher the risk of vasospasm. Another scale is the World Federation of Neurological Surgeons scale, which goes from 1 to 5. It is used for prognosis. It correlates the Glasgow Coma score with the presence or absence of focal neurological deficit. The higher the grade, the higher the more. The score is to be generated when the patient first arrives to the emergency room. Essentially, if a patient arrives comatose to the emergency room it indicates that the brain has been ischemic for many minutes and therefore the worse the prognosis. The hunt has scale is also used for prognosis, and goes from 1 to 5. The higher the grade the higher the mortality. This grade should be generated. This grade should be generated, also, from the clinical data at the moment of arrival to the emergency room. The phenomenon of vasospasm is a subacute inflammation of the meninges and blood vessels exposed to the clot. The body is trying to remove this debris, and does it the only way it knows how via inflammation. The inflammatory response, on average, takes several days to peak. Arteries, the arterial wall gradually becomes infiltrated with inflammatory cells, swollen, and the muscularis layer hypertrophic and hyperreactive. The inflammation and infiltration narrows the lumen, stenoses the lumen, and the internal surface becomes irregular. Both, the cytokine milieu, and the irregularities of the internal surface may lead to thrombosis. Thrombosis. Since vasospasm also implies a chemical meningitis, the patient may develop fever and leukocytosis, and in more severe cases, even evidence of chemical encephalitis. Just like cerebral edema, the inflammatory process of vasospasm is typically monophasic. Most vasospasm is mild and requires mostly careful observation for several until it subsides. The symptoms of brain ischemia do not show until the stenosis is 60 to 70 percent, which is when the stenosis become hemodynamically significant. Vasospasm is treated with normovolemia and hypertension when it gives symptoms, or it is detected by TCD, or when it is 60 to 70 percent or more by angiography. Transcranial angiography. Transcranial Doppler cannot detect vasospasm that is less than 50 percent, and only starts detecting it when it starts to become hemodynamically significant, or 60 to 70 percent. In the window of vasospasm, avoid long-acting antihypertensives, as their long-acting effect may have to be overcome if the patient develops clinical vasospasm and counter the aphid pressor therapy. This graph plotting vasospasm over time, in days, shows how the vasospasm is monophasic and its highest risk is between days 4 and 12. Vasospasm can be of various intensities, from subclinical, to very severe, and peaks also at different times in different patients. It is considered that the window for vasospasm is up to Once vasospasm is past its peak, it is rare that it recurs. When monitoring with transcranial Doppler, the first TCD should be done on day 1 or 2 and be a complete TCD. Then, depending on the clinical grade, TCD could be done every other day for the first 8 to 14 days. In the lower grade cases, and every day for the first 10 days in the higher clinical grades, angiographic and TCD grading of the vasospasm do not directly correlate. It is important to address the issue of blood pressure management. The blood pressure goals should be given in ranges. For example, say, goal SBP between 140 to 160 millimeters of mercury, and not, keep the SBP lower than 160. If the aneurysm is unsecured typically the blood pressure range will be set between 100 and 160, and the physician will help fine-tune this range. Once the aneurysm is secured, either by clipping or coiling, then the blood pressure can be more liberally set between 100 and 180 millimeters of mercury. If the patient is having symptomatic vasospasm, then the SBP ranges will be generally set between 160 and 200. After 21 days, or past the peak of the vasospasm, the blood pressure could be set as per the current hypertension guidelines to an SBP of 120 plus minus 10. If the patient is on IV pressors, then the patient should also be on IV crystalloids, such as 75 milliliters per hour. When weaning hypertensive therapy, gra gradually wean the IV presser first, and once off, wean the IV crystalloid last. You will find the complete bedside clinical algorithm for the management of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage in the neuro ICU. The hyperlinks are live.
please look in the description for the disclaimer. Additional information and links to some relevant bibliography.